Good morning. It feels like just a short while ago that I was, I've been through this before, I should, should get through it now, that I was standing here and looking out at the same beautiful faces. I'm so glad that you've come back to remember our mother as you remembered our father. I want to introduce my cousins from Iowa, Worthen and Moretta Gradden, and Gordon and Helen Gradden. Worthen and Gordon are my mother's nephews, the sons of her sister, Stephanie. I don't have time to introduce all the members of the family on my father's side. <laughs> and I don't need to. Browns have lived in Cumberland County since 1970, when my grandparents, T.C. and Viola Brown, came to retire here in Pleasant Hill. One year later, Dick and Trudy Brown, with me and Kwame and Alan and Lois, took a two-year furlough in Crossville. And we've been coming back ever since. When my parents retired from 21 years of service in Ghana in 1978, they came back to Crossville uh, to continue their work in health care in Tennessee. And when they retired, they settled here in Pleasant Hill. And then dad's brother Ted and his wife Donna, also retired here, followed more recently by Ted and Dick's uh, cousin, Marion Brown Zebel. And the next generation has been showing up here every two or three months, one or two or 30 at a time. <laughs> you who live in this part of Tennessee have grown accustomed to Browns, even learning to spell and pronounce our name <laughs> properly, <laughs> and welcoming us over and over. And we feel very much at home here. Our dear old friends from Ghana, who are here today, also know our father's side of the family better than our mother's side. Uh, my grandparents lived uh, and worked for three years in Pecky Blengo uh, at the seminary there. And every time uh, you folks, you, you missionary folks, uh, passed through the Inner Church Center in New York, you ran into Ted. But not many of you know our mother's side of the family, and I want to tell you about it. Mom was the fourth and youngest child of Charles and Elizabeth Camp. Charles Camp was a Connecticut Yankee and an artist, a sculptor who worked with wood and stone to make beautiful statues and reliefs. He studied at the world-renowned Art Institute of Chicago, and he attended the 1900 Paris Exposition. Now, I wish I could say that he recognized the brilliance of the French Impressionist and Post-Impressionist, but the truth is that he found them frivolous and even decadent. He believed that art must be more than aesthetic. It must serve a clear and good purpose. And when he returned to Chicago, he gave up sculpture and devoted himself to carving cabinets and furniture that were both pleasing to the eye and useful. Mom's mother's family name is Morse. Her great uncle was Samuel F. B. Morse, a portrait painter and the inventor of the telegraph. After the Civil War, my grandmother's grandparents moved from New York to Oak Park, Illinois, a prairie town at that time, now practically Chicago. The Morris family became a pillar of the first congregational church of Oak Park. Many years later, my parents were married there. 
But first, Elizabeth Morse and Charles Camp were married there. My grandmother told me the story many times, how she was in her first year at Colorado College when her beau, the handsome Charles Camp, showed up on the all-woman's campus, having ridden a horse and buggy all the way from Oak Park, Illinois, to Boulder, Colorado. <laughs> and she left with him. <laughs> After their wedding in Oak Park, they traveled out west and settled in Weezer, Idaho. My grandfather made farm implements as well as cabinets and furniture and he planted an orchard. Estelle, Stephanie, and Charles were born in Weezer, and so was Gertrude. But she came 13 years after her brother, and 19 and 20 years after her sisters. Within the family, she was called Surprise. <laughs> Born in 1930, she was a child of the Great Depression. People could no longer afford artisan furniture. Her mother took in mending and sewed clothes for neighbors as well as the family. Her father was lucky to get a job at an, an industrial arts school in Billings, Montana, where he taught carpentry. Her family lived in the dormitory and her parents were the caretakers of 50 boys and young men. That was my mother's childhood home. And she remembered it fondly. She and her brother sitting with the students at long crowded dining tables. Her parents finding ways to stretch meager provisions and foster good conversation and good cheer. When America entered the Second World War, the young men all joined the armed forces and the Polytechnic Institute had to close. Mom and her parents moved to Helena, Montana, and then to Cody, Wyoming. Wherever they went, they joined a church. That was always very important to them. My, my grandfather, in one place in Montana, designed a chapel and built the altar and the pews himself. My grandmother was a member of the Congregational Church Board of Commissioners of Foreign Missionaries, Foreign Missions. And once a year, she would take a train across the, the country to attend the annual conference. On several trips, she took her little girl. My mother never forget, forgot meeting a missionary couple and hearing of their work in Africa. When mom was 12, she and her parents moved into the old Victorian house in Oak Park, Illinois, in which her mother had been born and where her grandparents still lived and were soon to die. Alongside her mother, she became her grandparents' nursing assistant. There were many times when she also helped take care of her father. He had barely survived a typhus epidemic when he was a young man and after that, his health was rarely strong, robust. Out west, he had been an outdoorsman, but working in a furniture factory in Chicago, breathing sawdust and shellac all day, was much harder on him than working in a carpentry shed in big sky country. Mom got accustomed to doctors coming to the house. and she grew very interested in their work. She also took up the flute and became, to her surprise, a star of the high school orchestra. She spent her summers with her sister Stephanie, who had gone to college in Iowa and married a local farmer, Leland Grattan. Mom would take the train from Chicago to the shining buckle of the Corn Belt and help her sister manage three boys, Worthen, Albert, and Gordon. Upon graduating from Oak Park High School, she enrolled in Stephanie's alma mater, Grinnell College. There, in some of her pre-med classes, in the Christian Student Fellowship, 
and in the flute section of the college orchestra, she met a sophomore named Dick Brown, whom she asked on a date before he had worked up the gumption to ask her. <laughs> when Dick Brown graduated, Trudy left Grinnell, a year shy of her degree, with her father now too ill to work steadily, paying for a private college education was impossible. So she lived at home and rode the L into Chicago to take classes at the Navy Pier campus of the University of Illinois. She wanted to be a doctor, and she had all the qualities to be a very good one. But in those days, there were no medical school scholarships for women. So she applied to the Washington University School of Nursing in St. Louis, Missouri, which welcomed her with a scholarship. Washington University had a good nursing school, a good medical school, a good second year medical student, <laughs> and a good policy allowing married students to live together. And so it was that Trudy Camp and Dick Brown married while they were both students. Generally not a good idea, but in this case it worked out well. Elizabeth Camp made her daughter's wedding dress. The newly titled Mrs. Brown earned her nursing degree in RN, worked as a home visiting nurse in St. Louis while her husband got his MD, and became a mother in Indianapolis, Indiana, delivering me at the hospital where my father was doing his residency. A year later, the United Church Board for World Ministries commissioned Dr. and Mrs. Brown to serve in Ghana, and the three of us arrived there on the first day of Ghanaian independence, March 6th, 1957. That day was, of course, historic for Ghanaians and also for our family. But as I said earlier, I don't need to say much about the Browns, except to emphasize that Trudy Brown was first and always Trudy Camp. Her parents' lessons, values, and examples were integral to her character and her decisions throughout her life. Her faith, though not as orthodox as her parents' faith, it was as deep. Hers was a faith full of wonder, both kinds of wonder, awe and questioning. But it was an abiding faith nonetheless. It was the source of her quiet strength and it guided her words and deeds all her life her unfeigned hospitality and calm resourcefulness, her generosity with her knowledge, abilities, and time, her skill as a nurse, her unmistakable empathy with people, whether they were happy or hurting, her clear and constant love, which radiated outward from her immediate family to all its branches, close or distant or grafted, and beyond, to people who are not biologically or legally related to her. Many of my oldest and dearest friends have told me, your mother was like a mother to me. And that expression of, expression of kinship is deeply touching to me and to my brothers and sister. We are family, all of us. I believe the genuine care and respect that people felt from mom was something that she learned from her parents, who took responsibility for all those boys, many of them orphans, at that school in Montana. Mom said that as a little girl, she felt like she had not just one brother, but 50. And my grandmother used to chuckle and say, those boys could be rascals but they were on their best behavior around little Gertrude. <laughs> Maybe that's why mom was always such a kind person. She had grown up with kindness shown to her and her kindness appreciated. Not that her childhood was idyllic, far from it. There was much more hardship than ease. There was illness and death, but her parents faced every challenge with faith, grace, 
dignity, kindness, and love. And that was how their daughter Trudy, my mother Trudy, lived her life.